Okay, good afternoon. Okay, so this is going to be the most difficult session <laughs> after all the food we had. Uh, so keep an eye on the people on your table. <laughs> Make sure they don't doze off. The, uh, just uh, give them a little tap in case anybody's drifting off. Okay, so session three, page 11. We talked about real manhood, session one, session two, real issues, uh, emphasizing the, the importance of values and priorities and character. These are things we cannot compromise on as we pursue manhood, uh, becoming like Christ, Christ-likeness. So we want to talk about in this session on real success, what is real success look like and you know what should be our understanding of real success look like and to get us started i want to you know for us i want us to think about king solomon you know we read about his life first kings and um, you know what a start to his life he had a such a wonderful History, son of King David, everything already established, right? Empire, kingdom already set. Commissioned to do a great work. From the time he came to the throne, first task, build a temple. And everything needed to build the temple was in place. David took care of all of that. I mean... All he had to do is put his name on it. I built the temple. But actually the work was done by his father, David. Everything in place. And God was so gracious. He asked Solomon, what do you want? One thing you ask. And he asked for the right thing. He was taught right by his father, David. So he asked for wisdom. And God gave him wisdom. So no lack even there. No lack. And sure enough, he walked in that for a good amount of time. He walked in that. He did a good job. He got the temple built, kingdom established, administering justice with the wisdom God had given him. His reputation, his fame spread. People came to see, you know, the, the magnificence of what was happening. God had done such a great thing, elevated him to, you know, such a great place. And yet by the time you come to 1 Kings chapter 11, 11 chapters, the Bible records such a sad situation. And I want us to read that, you know, uh, because it is so heartrending to read this portion of Scripture. Now, remember, King Solomon is the one who wrote... The book of Proverbs, today you and I read it and it's so enriching, so enriching. And yet to read this, 1 Kings chapter 11, I'm just going to read this. But King Solomon, now this is, you know, after he's been all the success, everything, he's done everything, all that, you're coming towards the latter stage of his life. And this is what we read. But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, Women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sid Sid Sidonians, and Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David." For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after 
Milcom, the ab abomination of the Ammonites, Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord, as did his father David. Verse 7, then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice. I mean, he had visitation from God. Verse 10, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep, the, the, keep what the Lord had commanded. So, a very, very sad description of what happened to Solomon. So that's what we want to think about. You've got success, you've got achievements, you've got fame, you've got everything. Then what? And hopefully what happened to Solomon will not happen to any of us. Hey. Solomon has, he couldn't say, hey, I didn't know. God appeared to him twice and warned him about this exact thing. Hey, Solomon, be careful. And God had foreknowledge, of course. He could see ahead of time. He warned him ahead of time. Solomon, be careful. And here's this man. I mean, he had nothing lacking. No excuse. No excuse. Life gone. So then we need to talk about these things. What made Solomon abandon Everything, his encounter with God, the wisdom God had given him, everything, the wealth, the splendor, everything he abandoned just because he had weakness for women. Just weakness. And that weakness destroyed not only him, it destroyed the nation that he was supposed to take care of. Because in the end, it not only affected him, he started building high places for all these gods and the whole nation that he was supposed to watch over, that he was supposed to shepherd. The whole nation got corrupted because one man gave in to his weakness, even though he had everything. So this shows us the, the seriousness of this. That if our lusts are not crucified, dealt with correctly, it can ruin not just us, but the people that we are supposed to take care of, starting with our own families, and then extending to all that God has entrusted to each one of us. Meaning, your lust, my lust, if it's not checked, if it's not dealt with, can ruin everything God has divinely blessed, graciously poured, and not just ruin that, but ruin my life and everything God has entrusted. That's what happened. So, love and lust. We are called to walk in love, but get rid of lust. Love seeks to bless people, and it seeks to give. Lust is, I want to benefit myself at the expense of somebody else, at others. And it's seeking to get. Big difference. Big difference. And the Bible tells us to overcome the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But these are the three areas the world is hitting us, bombarding us. 
the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These three things can ruin any of us. And the thing is this, that if once we become successful, you know, we are growing professionally, financially, all these things, you know, we're praying, God is blessing, God is good, God is graciously blessing us. If this is not kept in check, if our lusts are not dealt with, all of this that God gives to us can be squandered, can be wasted, and things can go, go wrong. So pleasing self is the pleasure principle behind lust. Pleasing God is a pleasure principle behind obedience, behind a life of a godly life. So whom are we choosing to please? Pleasing self, lustful life. Pleasing God, godly, obedient life. And this is where our choices are important. You see, we all have a choice. We can't say, I didn't have a choice. You had a choice. Yeah. A man committing adultery. The wife asks him, were you not thinking about me and the children? I was thinking about you, but... My pleasure, my desire to gratify my pleasure overpowered reason. The pleasure of self-gratification. So there is reason, but this pleasure overpowers. And so many women are, are broken, are hurt. You know, just this past week, I was this one day actually, like I think on... I don't want to mention the date because staff will know, but <laughs> this is past week. Lady sitting and talking. And a husband, now I'm talking about people in the church. I'm not talking about people in the world. She comes and says, my husband is into porn. I've caught him, caught him many times. Now we're talking about a Christian, talking about people in church. And I could see, she says, it makes me feel worthless, devalues me. You know, this, this woman sitting in front of me and talking makes me feel worthless. So, husband's weakness, watching porn. He thinks, oh, I'm not doing anybody any harm. I'm not hurting anybody. He doesn't know. His wife is feeling so devalued, cheap. He's not realizing that. At that moment, he feels like, I am satisfying my lust, my pleasure. I'm not hurting anybody. You are hurting somebody, your own wife. How is she going to come and tell the husband, Husband doesn't understand. But this is the problem in the church. I'm talking about the church. I'm not talking about the world. In the church. So, does this man have a choice then? Is he successful? Yeah, he's successful. He has money. Family is all cared for. But this is the life. He's living a life of lust. Does he have a choice? Yes, of course, he has a choice. He has a choice. And, his, and remember this, the choices determine destiny. Your choices are determining where you're going. Destiny doesn't happen by chance. It happens by choice. And everything in life is under the power of our choice, your choice. But once the choice is made, you have to face the result, the consequence. You're under now the power of that choice. So, 
I want to highlight a few things here. While we, there is winning and accomplishments and greatness, here are things that should be more important to us than these things. Because beyond these things, beyond the success and the accomplishments and wealth and all of that, these are the things that are going to stabilize our life. It's going to keep us stable. Number one, living in the fear of the Lord. Living in the fear of the Lord. That can never be lost, should never be lost. Because that's what restrains you and me from evil, from living or giving place to gratifying our lusts. When you're very successful, I mean, you can see it in the world. What do successful men? They think they can do anything. They're not answerable to anybody. Finished. They can womanize. They can do anything. Hey, you got the money. Money answers everything. They got power. They got position. Who are they going to answer? Nobody. But what, when you come into such a place, when God blesses you, and you're, you're, you're in that place of power and influence and money and success and everything is there, God has blessed you. What will now keep you and me stable? The fear of the Lord restrains us from evil. Fear of the Lord. Remember, Solomon built high places for you and me. Our high places are built in our minds, right? It's not physical things we are building, but in our minds, we build high places. It's the secret thoughts, the fantasies, all those things that go on and they guard your mind. Keep your mind in the fear of the Lord. Your mind is your sacred space. Keep it consecrated to God. See, you can, you can keep a physical place clean, but more important than the physical place is keep your mind clean. Keep it like a sacred place before God. Because that all starts there. Keep your mind in the fear of the Lord. Every thought, every imagination, everything you want to dream of, Keep it all under the fear of God. Dream. Dream big. But keep your dreams in the fear of the Lord. Have big visions. Great. But keep it all in the fear of God. Otherwise, it becomes a high place like what Solomon built. To some God is something which God said don't do. And of course, we overcome this Overcome lust through the power of the Holy Spirit. And stay in the fear of the Lord when handling money. So God blesses you, makes you successful. Uh, all of those wonderful things are happening. Money is flowing. Both pockets are full. Or four pockets. <laughs> four pockets are full. Wonderful. That's good. But remember, money itself has no morality. Money is neutral. Money's only morality or immorality is in the heart of the person who has the pockets. It's neutral. Whether it's going to be good in your life or not good in your life is how, what you determine it to be from your heart. That's it. You keep your heart in the fear of the Lord, everything in your pockets will be kept that way. It will be used for the glory of God. It will bless people. It will, it will not destroy you. It will not destroy anybody. It will be used right. Second value that we maintain when there is real success. God has blessed you everything. You know, that, is, that itself is not real success. If you keep yourself in the fear of the Lord, that's success number one. Second, 
Sabe? You serve. Serving people. And this is where true maturity is seen. Because maturity is not something of, of physical age. But maturity is the ability to carry responsibility. That's how you measure maturity. So true maturity is our acceptance of responsibility. And we accept the responsibility of serving. Serving people. And when we talk about serving, we're not trying to, you know, compensate for what others don't do for themselves. But when you say serving, you're meeting the needs of people out of love and out of selflessness. You know. So you're saying, I love you and I want to be selfless and I'm, I'm serving you. So taking on the responsibility to serve is a sign of maturity. Taking on the responsibility. So when God is blessing you, doing wonderful things, number one, keep yourself in the fear of the Lord. Number two, we must take on the responsibility to serve. Let me do something for you out of love, out of selflessness. Not because you're lazy, not because somebody else is lazy and don't want to you know, take care of themselves, but where they can't help themselves, where there's a need, step in and serve. And Jesus did this. Jesus took on the responsibility to serve. And one of the most powerful statements he made is, you know, I have come not to be served, but to serve. Ah. This is God. Can't imagine this. <laughs> this is God coming on earth. And he's saying, I have come not to be served, but to serve. And so as real men who are pursuing Christ-likeness as our manhood, so okay, I take on the same thing. I'll do the same thing. I'm here to, not to be served, but to serve. Wherever God is, you know, God has placed each of us in different places. I'm not saying we're all doing the same service, but wherever God has, wherever God has placed you, you have this attitude. I'm going to serve. And Jesus gave us this, and just put these scriptures here, Matthew 20, you know, he taught his disciples, you know, you don't be like the, the world. They have their formula for greatness, but in the kingdom, the, great, the formula for greatness is whoever is least will be greatest. And John 13, he gave an example, he washed his, the feet of his disciples, and he said, look, if I am your Lord and Master, and I'm doing this, I'm doing this because I'm setting you an example. I want you to follow. I want you to follow this example. So for us as real men, greatness comes through serving. And the more we serve, the greater we, be we become. We must understand fame and greatness are not synonymous. Madonna was famous. Mother Teresa was great. Different people. Famous, greatness. Two different things. Just because somebody's famous doesn't mean they're great. Because greatness is determined by who they are and how they serve people. And I would encourage all of us, start where we are. You know, start where you are. Many of, us, many of us are waiting to go where we want to get to, to start. No, 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 no. You can't. That will never happen. You start where you are. Start serving where you are. Whatever you can, who you find. Start where you are. And then you'll get to where you want to be. Start small ways. 
start. Inactivity produces nothing. So, when you start doing something, then you will begin to discover your gifts and uh, how, you're going to, how you're called to minister. So don't keep sitting with the wisdom, the experience, the knowledge, all that God has blessed you with. Don't sit and die with it. Do something with it. Pass it on. Invest it. The third important thing for us to understand is death, res page 13, death, resurrection, fruitfulness. That in the kingdom of God, fruitfulness comes through dying. So Jesus put it like this, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground, it remains just by itself. But if it dies, it brings forth more fruits. But the process, of, so the, the process of death is what leads to resurrection. Resurrection brings glory. It brings multiplication. But many of us don't like the process of death. So, putting it in context, what is real success? God brings great things in your life. He does all those things. But, in the midst of all that, God may call you and me to die. Die to self. So in what way is it? It's different for each one of us. I'm not saying it's the same thing. But in some way, in your life, God is going to say, I want you to die. I want you to be that grain of wheat that will fall into the ground. So that when that happens, there can be more Okay. I don't know how it's going to happen in your life, but that's our important truth that we have to live by. You say, go before God. Say, God, you've blessed me. All, all this is wonderful. But show me how I can be fruitful, how I can multiply, and God will show you where you need to die. But remember, death only leads to greater. Fruitfulness. Everyone's awake or not? It's very quiet now. It's like, hey, 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 did people fall asleep or something? <laughs> Death only leads to greater fruitfulness. So, that's a value we hold on to. While God is blessing you, is doing all these things, you know, so it's a winning and accomplishment, success, everything. What next? Ha. Ah. God says, come, can you die with me? Can you die for me? What area? I don't know how it will be. But when you die, it will lead to more fruitfulness. That's important. Keep that in mind. So the real secret for success then is being able to die. I'm talking about our perspective, right? Is being able to die so that you can bear fruit for the kingdom of God. And this works in marriage as well. Marriage is successful because each partner is dying a little. Now, you don't tell this in pre-marriage <laughs> marriage preparation course. <laughs> After they get married, <laughs> give the revelation. <laughs> marriage, welcome to death. <laughs> Nobody wants to get married. <laughs> but the reality is this, right? In marriage, each person is dying to themselves so that the marriage can flourish. Right? It's not about my rights, privileges. No, you die so that things can be wonderful. Another value we hold, it, while... There is all this blessing that's happening. This is real success for us. We measure real success by how we stay in the fear of the Lord, how we serve people, how we are able to die for the kingdom so that there can be fruitfulness. That's how we measure success. And we measure success by seeking first the kingdom. 
seeking first the kingdom. That means while God blesses you, everything, your heart is still, still God. What can I do for the kingdom? Seek first the kingdom. What can I do to advance your kingdom, your rule and reign in my life and through me in the lives of people around me? What can I do then for that? And again here, God will call each one of us differently. There's no set pattern or set formula. Each one of us will be called by God to express that in a certain way. How you can express seeking first the kingdom. That in your life you know that you are putting God's kingdom first. How that works out in your life, that's between you and God, right? But that's real success. That while God has blessed me, God has done this, God has done that in my life, I've put the kingdom first. That's real success. Moses, he had it set. <laughs> Adopted into Pharaoh's family. You know, God orchestrated that. He grew up in the palace, had the best education, raised up as uh, the, you know, Pharaoh's da daughter's son, had everything. And yet at that, a time came and he realized there was a call on his life. Everything had happened for a purpose. It came into his heart that God had raised him up to be a deliverer. There was a higher purpose in all this. Yes, he was raised up in the palace. He had the best education. He could have succeeded the throne. Who knows? All that. But suddenly, all he understood, Acts chapter 7 says, he understood that God had done all of this for a higher purpose. And you can imagine, I don't know, he must have been pacing up and down in the palace, in his room or the corridor. Hey, I could be the next person on the throne. Or I have to leave this for the calling. Because God raised me up to deliver his people. I don't know how we came to that moment in time where he said, I am choosing, Hebrews puts it so powerfully, I'm choosing, I'm letting go of being called Pharaoh's daughter and I'm willing to suffer affliction with the people of God. I'm willing to do it. I don't know how, how he came to that moment. Try to imagine this. Everybody serving him, everything. And he had to make the decision. I'm willing to step out of all of this for the sake of those people that I'm supposed to deliver. Seek first the kingdom. That must, that must have been a big step. Now, of course, how we went about it, he made some mistake. He went and killed the Egyptian, all of that. He made some mistake because he was trying to figure out how, how am I supposed to do this? But the fact is he came to the point where he said, I will accept that. I'll accept my call. So he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater than the treasures in Egypt. So seeking the eternal causes the temporal to follow. If you seek the temporal, you'll miss the eternal. And remember, the eternal is always more important than the temporal. We saw it in the previous session. The, in, the intangible is more important than the tangible. So invest, however God has called you. you know, I'm not, there's, there's different ways. God will call each one of us to seek first the kingdom. How God calls you, you invest your energy, all that God has given you for the sake of the kingdom. Remember, whatever you give to God is never wasted and God is worthy of our best. Give it. How he calls you to do it, do it. But he's worthy of it. Of it and more. He's worthy of it and more. Right? Never forget that. 
So essentially what we're doing is we're just being good stewards because we don't own what we possess and it's only given to us for a season. So we're just being good stewards when you take that and seek first the kingdom. So that's real success for us. And, sorry, last point, last one. Page 14, All right? So be good stewards of what God's given to us and be a good steward of your time as well. We're coming back to the issue of time. Be a good steward of the time. All of us have that. All of us are given time. So those who, if you waste time, it's laziness. But if you conquer time, you'll be productive. Last, last way we measure success, okay? We for us, this is true success. It is to please God. It is to please God. I want us to think about this. When Jesus walked on the earth, as a man, the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And he was referring to the humanity not just the deity. To God was well pleased, not just with the deity, but with the humanity, the manhood of Jesus. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Please, well pleased. And Jesus said, I always do those things which please the Father, John 8. I always do what pleases the Father. So for us, that is success. If we are pleasing the Father's heart, that is the true measure of success for us. Yes, win, achieve, accomplish, do well in whatever God has called you to do, all of that is good. But the true measure of success is if God can look at you and me and say, you have pleased my heart. You've pleased my heart in whatever he's called us to do. That's true measure of success for us. And it's quite possible, and I'm not saying this will always happen, but it's quite possible that when you please God, at least a few people will be happy. <laughs> at least some people will be happy that you please God. I'm not saying everybody, but so, so that's fine if people are happy. That's a byproduct. That's okay. Think about this. There is a place in God where God is our portion and that's all we need. There is a place of rest in God. It overcomes all anxiety. There's a place of contentment in God. It overcomes all greed. There's a place of fulfillment in God. It overcomes all our searching and striving for other things. There's a place of peace in God. It overcomes strife. You don't want, you're not interested in any form of strife. There's a place of security in God. It overcomes all insecurity. There's a place of living in God where we can die to self and not feel anything. It overcomes pride. So, what is real success for us? It is to walk in God's will for our lives as real men, secure in our manhood and our relationship with Him. That's place. Do the will of God. And that And that's our highest good. And it also, okay, maybe I just, it also gives God pleasure. So, what are we saying today? This is how we look at real success. Is it the mic that's making that? Oh, I'll say, oh, I'll say. I thought it was the mic making that. <laughs> 
<laughs> so how do we measure success? If we can keep ourselves in the fear of God. If we can serve people. Serve people. Right? If we can... Where did I put it here? We can... We resist lust. We live in the fear of the Lord. We serve God and people selflessly. We are dying to self wherever God calls us so we can bear fruit, be fruitful. We seek first the kingdom and we please God above all others. That is how we look at success. Amen.